So now it's time to calculate carrier concentration in extrinsic silicon. In the previous video, we looked at the uh, concentration of electrons and holes in n-type and p-type silicon. We found that in n-type silicon, the concentration of electrons rises and the concentration of holes drops as the Fermi level rises above the mid-gap. We see the opposite in p-type silicon. Now, there's something of a trade-off happening here. The more the electron concentration, the less the hole concentration. And this all has to be with the point of 0.5 probability of finding electrons or the Fermi level. The closer the Fermi level moves to the conduction band edge, the more electrons we have, but the less holes. This seems to suggest that there is some sort of relationship between hole and, con and electron concentration. There's some sort of constancy here. This constancy is represented in something called the mass action law. The mass action law states that the product of the electron and hole concentration is a constant, regardless of the kind of doping that we use. It is a constant value that is only a function of temperature. Since this is a constant for all types of silicon, regardless of their doping, it is also a constant for intrinsic silicon, where N is Ni and P is Ni. So N times P, the product of electron and hole, con hole concentration, is equal to Ni square. So this is only a function of temperature because Ni, the intrinsic concentration of electrons and holes, is only a function of temperature. Now, what this relation tells us is that as electron concentration rises, hole concentration must drop proportionately and vice versa so that the two concentrations have to keep the same uh, product between them. This relationship, the uh, uh, mass action law, together with electrical neutrality are the two relationships that will allow us to calculate charge densities in any type of silicon. Now imagine that we have a piece of silicon and that we have added both donors and acceptors in uh, the piece of silicon. So it contains both donors and acceptors. What are the charges that are within this piece of silicon? We have four types of charges. We have electrons and holes, and these are both mobile charge types. They are charge, they are, uh, charge carriers that can, that can carry current. But also when we add donors at a concentration ND and acceptors at a concentration NA, they create ions. The acceptors will create negative ions and the donors will create positive ions. Now, we can generally assume at room temperature that the concentration of acceptor ions is equal to the concentration of acceptor atoms, which means that we have full ionization. Similarly, we can assume full ionization for donors. So, the piece of silicon, the material, is electrically neutral. The net charge must be zero. It contains ionic charge that is positive and holes that are also positive. And these have to be equal to the negative ionic charge from acceptors and the electron concentration, which is negative. This is the electrical neutrality relationship. And assuming that we have full ionization, we can replace ND plus with ND and Na minus with Na. And this gives us a second relationship. Together with the mass action law, this allows us to find the concentration of electrons and holes regardless of the type of doping we use. Is it possible for us to use both kinds of dopants, acceptors and donors? It is, and it happens a lot during fabrication. The type of material we produce, whether it is n-type or p-type, will depend on which type of dopant is dominant, which is more than the other. But using these two relations, there are two relations and two unknowns, n and p, we can find n or p. Let's, for example, try to find n. So we will find p in terms of n as ni squared over n using the mass action law and then substitute in the charge neutrality equation nd plus ni squared over n equals na plus n. So this gives us a quadratic equation n squared plus na minus nd n plus ni squared, sorry, minus ni squared 
is equal to zero. Now, this can be solved to find an expression for n, which will be nd minus na plus root nd minus na square plus 4 ni square, and this is all over 2. We can similarly find an expression for p. These are both exact expressions for n and p. There are very important approximations that we can make here. If we assume that n is much greater than p, then we can assume from the, um, from the um, charge neutrality equation that n is equal to nd. This happens when we are only using donors for doping or when the donor concentration is much larger than the acceptor concentration. In that case, P is negligible next to N and NA is negligible next to, uh, next to, uh, to ND and then N is equal to ND approximately. From this, we can get P as NI squared over ND. Similarly, for P-type silicon, where P is much greater than N, we can assume that P is approximately equal to NA, and N is equal to NI squared over P, which is NA. Now, when do we use these approximate relationships? We use them most of the time. However, this exact solution is useful in one specific case. This is useful when electrons and holes from thermal generation are significant. These relationships, the, ex the approximate relationships are useful when electrons and holes from doping are dominant. So at high temperature where thermal generation is back to being effective, we have to use these exact solutions. Now, let's look at the expressions for carrier concentration that we obtained for intrinsic silicon because they are still valid for doped silicon. So we had N is equal to NC e to the power of minus EC minus EF over KT. And we also had P is equal to NV, e to the power of minus EF minus EV over KT. Now, these relationships are still valid for, um, for uh, intrinsic silicon, for uh, doped silicon, as well as for extrinsic silicon. But let's assume, for example, that we are um, working with n-type silicon where n is greater than p. So let's substitute and see what this inequality tells us. It tells us that nc over nv is greater than e to the power of um, uh, minus ef plus ev uh, minus ef plus ec over kt. This is similar to the equation we solved for um, intrinsic silicon, but in this case it is an inequality because they are not equal. And taking a log on both sides, again solving very similarly to what we did for intrinsic silicon, we get um, on, the, on the other side EC plus EV minus 2EF, and this gives us that EF is greater than EC plus EV over 2 plus a negligible term kt over 2 len nv and c over nv. Now, this term is generally negligible at room temperature, but what this uh, inequality tells us is that the Fermi level EF lies higher than the mid gap EC plus EV over 2, which is a conclusion we reached logically by looking at the graphs for carrier concentration in n type silicon, but we can confirm it analytically using these equations. Another thing that we have, uh, another expression that we have to develop now is when we look at N for any just general type of material, whether it's intrinsic, extrinsic, uh, N type or P type, and let's write Ni, which is the intrinsic level of electrons. This is going to be Nc e to the power of minus Ec minus EI, where EI is the Fermi level in intrinsic silicon, which lies at the middle of the band gap. And so N divided by NI is going to get rid of the constant NC, which is a very unwieldy constant, and instead give us a relationship that is um, very useful, uh, which is that N over NI is equal to E to the power of EF minus EI over KT. Simply that N is equal to NI e to the power of EF minus EI 
over kt, and that p is equal to ni e to the power of ei minus ef over kt. Now, if we multiply n times p, it will give us ni squared, which is something we know. This is the mass action law. Now, what, is, what are these two equations doing? They are expressing the carrier concentration in terms of intrinsic carrier concentration. And it's saying that N, the concentration of electrons, is going to increase above the intrinsic level if EF rises above EI, which is the mid-gap. And it's going to drop below the intrinsic level if EF drops below EI. And vice versa for P, which is the whole concentration. Now, there's one thing that we have to discuss, which is when we say that N times P is equal to NI squared, and that increasing one decreases the other, this doesn't mean that we are decreasing or keeping the conductivity constant. In fact, adding any kind of doping to silicon, any kind of net doping to silicon, will increase its conductivity significantly. This is because we are keeping the product of N and P constant. But there's some, there, um, if we add them, that summation is going to be much bigger. And so, as we will see in the next video, the, uh, the conductivity will increase substantially.